Hey YouTube, it's Robert Holland. In today's video, we're gonna talk about all the things that I learned from my first underwater shoot. My channel is sponsored by Adorama, which buys me the time to create these type of videos without the influence from any specific camera brand. I personally shop at Adorama for their great deals on a wide variety of products, as well as their support of those products down the road. So if you end up enjoying this video and you're interested in any of the products discussed in this video, Give Adorama thanks by using the links in the description below. So the other day I had a university shoot where we were supposed to photograph some championship swimmers and we wanted to do it in the pool environment and I thought what better way to kick it up than to actually try and do this underwater. I have wanted to do an underwater shoot for so long just to be in a new unique environment and I think there's a lot of really cool visuals that you can achieve underwater. So I thought it would be an excellent opportunity to try it out is having these swimmers in their natural habitat. The first thing I want to talk about is actually getting there early. Now I knew to be prepared for this because this has screwed up shoots that I've done in the past is when you're going from a cool, dry environment to a warm and humid environment or vice versa, you're going to introduce some condensation on your lens from the dramatic shift in temperatures. It's where your like, lens fogs up and you can't see anything. Your viewfinder would fog up and you can't really see through it. Everything fogs up when you have those dramatic temperature and humidity shifts. So one thing I knew was to get there like 30 minutes early, bring everything out and just let it acclimate to the temperature before I started to use it, which made sure that throughout the entire shoot, my gear wasn't fogging up, whether we were above water or underwater. Now, of course, the biggest concern here is getting your camera underwater. You can get a full-on underwater housing for a specific camera to make sure that everything's tight and then you get access to controls and such, um, but those are extremely expensive. What the so I knew that that wasn't gonna be an option for the budget of the shoot. But I did remember another tool that I've seen a friend use in the past called the Dicapack, Dicapack? Either way, not a good name, but it's spelled D-I-C-A-P-A-C. -A -A That's the name of the product. And what this is, is a simple pouch that cameras of various sizes can kind of load into, and you zip lock the top, that's kind of your rubber seal, and then roll it down and Velcro it, and that is your underwater housing for your camera. Now, this is not a full-on dive underwater product. This is meant for very shallow work or even just protecting your camera in the rain. But it's under $100, which makes it an awesome option if you're really trying to get into underwater shooting at a low price. Felt very scary to put your camera underwater when all that was between it was, you know, one Ziploc style rubber seal and rolling Velcro up. That didn't seem like enough but it worked perfectly. I was going below the surface, I had my, my bag completely submerged with my camera in it, and there was not a single drop of water even after being in that pool for over an hour. I was also surprised by the optical clarity that you had shooting through that hard piece of plastic. I've had UV filters affect my sharpness more than this pack did, so shooting through that, that was another concern of mine, and it didn't affect my images at all. Another little thing about the Digipack is in using it, you gotta watch, especially when you're using a wider angle lens, you have to watch the corners of it where the rubber goes in front of the lens, because if you're not careful and not keeping an eye on it, they can easily like drift into your corners, and it's kind of similar to vignetting, but you'll actually see the corners of it. It's like having a lens hood misaligned so you have to watch that otherwise that can kind of screw up your shot working with your camera inside of that Dica pack is a little bit tough because it's just not easy to get to all of your controls I was actually surprised I was able to fit my flash trigger in there at all but there was no way that I could control it the plastic was just too thick to actually get through and access things like the power wheel you could still kind of press buttons on it but in anything with a dial didn't really work that well. Now there are some little finger holes. There's like a finger hole near the shutter and I could kind of slam the autofocus button through the back screen. So I did still have that level of control, which was nice because the autofocus worked great underwater, both in tracking a moving subject as well as face detect. Like face detect still worked perfectly fine, even though we're dealing with, you know, kind of distortion in terms of colors and focal length, that worked great. Eye autofocus, that didn't work at all, but that's understandable if my subjects had goggles on when they were underwater. And if you're interested in zooming a lens, there's also those finger holes in the lens compartment, so if you were using a zoom lens, you would have the opportunity to zoom back and forth, or manually focus. I had all these wild ideas for like three and four light setups, but unfortunately, as soon as I dropped more than six inches below the surface of the water, 
I had no communication to my strobes whatsoever. I was using the R2 Pro Mark II, so the Godox X-Pro upgrade from Adorama. I was using that and the 8400 Pro was the primary light that I was using in this situation. It just wouldn't communicate. I mean, I could, I could be standing in the pool, I could drop it one inches, good. Four inches, good. As soon as I cracked about six inches of my trigger below the surface, no chance it wasn't triggering at all. So that was the first lesson that I learned. Second, Water magnification is a thing and it is super weird. So I chose my 35 millimeter focal length thinking that that's a pretty good all around lens. It's, it's wide enough, but it's not ultra wide. Uh, I thought that would be a great selection for this type of shoot, but I actually wish I would have gone a little bit wider, something like 24 millimeters, because as soon as you go underwater, there's a magnification factor and all of a sudden everything is far bigger. And one of the things that I wanted to do on this shoot was a half above water, half below water style image. I've seen them before, but they must be some type of composite because in a single image, you're basically working with two different focal lengths above the surface of water and below. Here below the surface is zoomed in far more, which you can see in this sample, kind of how the bodies are enlarged and offset from where they would connect above water. This also means mentally I was composing all my shots to be 35 millimeters away when we were underwater, but as soon as I would go under and start shooting, I would realize that I'm actually at a much longer focal length and I need to back off if I want the composition that I'm looking for. Now, I did this shoot expecting some challenges. I expected to be thrown for a loop and things like the water magnification, those were definitely things that I had to adapt to. But by far the biggest challenge in shooting underwater was nothing to do with the camera. It all had to do with controlling your own body. Let me say, if you're standing in the water, that's not a problem. But as soon as we got to a point where we were in deep enough water that our feet were not on the ground, things became really difficult. The slight current of the pool would turn my body around and I didn't have my hands free to kind of adapt and tread water and move myself in the position that I wanted. There was also some buoyancy to the dike pack. So when it came to trying to get the entire camera and myself underwater, it was extremely difficult because you're fighting the lift that the dike pack itself is bringing you up to the surface. And I had as much air squeezed out of it as possible, but it didn't matter. The pressure and the buoyancy that was still left in there would easily pull me back up to the surface. I do wish I could have done some more complex lighting setups and gotten more particular about where I put my light. I think the next time I do this, I might actually try to do it with some LEDs really close to the surface, just so I don't have to worry about communicating with that lighting. And that way I can get underwater a little bit more because I think there's a lot of cool things that you can do once you get a little bit lower and you see that surface above you. It opens up a lot of opportunities. So I hope you enjoyed this look, this little behind the scenes slash lessons that I learned from shooting underwater for the first time. If you have any questions for me, let me know. If you enjoyed the video, leave it a like, subscribe if you'd like to see more, and until next time, keep on shooting.